All right. So the next thing, which is related, uh, the next two things are very related, and I talked about pixie dust, is how do you identify your magic moment? Um, and this is where I think you really need to think about technology and all of the new things that technology enables you to do. So for example, um, the magic moment for a lot of our guests when I came to check in was uh, because we had GPS information, we could actually notify them when they were close to their location. This is These are your check-in instructions. And then once you got in, we can actually notify you and help you connect to the, the Wi-Fi. And so that is a true magic moment that a platform could do very cheaply um, that doesn't involve a lot of effort, but really increases lovability. The, um, this isn't, this example isn't about incremental, but really about sweating the details. I can talk about uh, my experience of when I worked at Apple. Um, we had, um, when I was working at Apple, we had the executive speaker series where we could ask the executive any any questions that we had about their product management process how they build products and um one of the questions that somebody asked in the audience was you know when the first iphone came out why did the first iphone not have copy and paste and when you think about it it's such a like a obvious feature of course you should have copy and paste right every phone should have that um and johnny ive you know when he was sitting on stage you know how he is in his videos he's british and he thinks a lot it's how he is in person. And he's like, well, you know, it's not like we forgot to put it in copy and paste. We couldn't figure out how to do it well. You know, they couldn't, they hadn't sweat the details of how to do it well in this new form. So they didn't put it in, in at all. And really, I think that's really another way of um, adding to what you've said about really sweating the details and making sure that the product that's in the market isn't just viable, it's lovable. And I know, and I, so, that's become more and more important with the enormous amount of competition that that exists. Totally. Yeah. All right. Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for another wonderful Tuesday evening um, at for our event for Product Mastery Series. These events are sponsored by Product Faculty. At Product Faculty, we offer an advanced product management course for uh, PMs looking to upskill. We've got an awesome product leader joining us today, Joanna Jay-Z, Joanna Zhang Jay-Z. I'm gonna read Jay-Z's profile and you'll see how why we're so privileged to have her today. Joanna Zhang Jay-Z is currently the VP of product at Webflow. Prior to Webflow, she was a product leader at WeWork as well as Airbnb. On top of all this, Jay-Z also manages to give back to the community and teaches product management at Stanford. And on a more personal note, she is also going on mat leave next week. So among everything, we're really happy that you can come and give back, uh, especially during this time. So today's talk will be about launching minimum lovable products. And given the intense competition that exists, we can no longer win in the market with an, just an MVP. The format of the talk today will be a 30 minute talk followed by Q&A. As you guys have questions, please feel free to ask those questions in chat and we'll address them at the end of the talk. After we wrap up in about 15 minutes, you'll have the opportunity to virtually network with your peers and we encourage all of you guys to meet a fellow product manager, product leader during the networking portion. With that, let's kick it off, Jay-Z. We'll have you take it away. Awesome, thank you, Mo. So I'm gonna go ahead and screen share, one second. All right, so as Mo mentioned, um, today we're gonna to be talking about the minimal lovable product. And uh, the way he said it, I couldn't have said it better, which is in today's world where there are a lot of different products out there, how do you make sure you build something that people really love? And I think it's a difficult balance because when you um, spend time on lovability, um, it can actually take effort. So I think talking through some of those dynamics, some of those trade-offs, um, that's what today's talk is gonna be about. So uh, let's start with an anecdote. So imagine that you guys have moved to a city and in the city you realize that there aren't any pizza shops. And so you're like, well, pizza is something that everyone loves to eat. You know, there's literally no pizza shop here. It really makes sense for me to open up a pizza shop or a pizza restaurant. So you go about gathering your friends, you get people together, you rent out a space and you open up your, your pizza restaurant and uh, you fire up your oven. You know, it's your opening day. Um, and you're super excited, there's a line at the door um, and you can't wait to serve them. You can't wait for this town who's never experienced pizza to essentially try pizza for the first time. 
And uh, what you do is, you know, people line up, people start to eat some of the pizza you're selling and um, they actually don't like it. They don't, they, they're not smiling. They're not coming back. Um, and, you know, basically they're eating this type of pizza out of your oven. And so your conclusion could be in this town that I've moved to, there's just no demand for pizza. People just don't like it. They don't understand it. Or it's actually because the pizza that you serve them is not something that is actually edible. It's burnt. And so the really the moral of the story is how do you make sure that the product that you're actually delivering to the market is a, you know, an actual pizza that is um, has all the dimensions that pizza has, has all the amazing ingredients that pizza has, and that you're not serving something that is subpar and then essentially concluding that because people aren't using it, there's no demand for it. And so kind of like, you know, pizza is kind of funny. It's just a little bit of an anecdote. But in real life, this is very true. So back in the day, you know, there was an electric car. There have been many versions of electric cars over the years, um, but they really haven't taken off. And part of it is because um, just the form and the function and the appeal of electric car just wasn't there. And so, you know, as you all know, in today's world, uh, Tesla has proven very much so that um, electric is sexy and that um, you can very much build something that people really love and want, um, even if previous versions of it didn't work out. So in today's talk, we'll talk through a couple of different um, uh, principles that I think are really important um, in the agenda. We, there are four principles, so I'll be going through each of the four principles and walking through what I mean for each of them. So the first one that I think is really important to remember is that as a product manager, as a product leader, it's really, really important that you are starting with a user's why and you're not starting with a business why. Um, the business why will be provided. So I'll give you an example. Um, whenever you're working in a company, right, as a product manager, the business why will be there because the company will have a very strong reason to want to do things. But your job as the product manager or leader is to actually understand what is the why for the user. So I'll give you an example from Airbnb. The business why is really clear from a supply and demand side. Um, the business why on the supply side is you grow the supply of homes. When you grow the supply of homes, you can match it to demand and essentially have a vibrant marketplace. That is a business why and a company why. Um, what the product, what I did on this team specifically, and what we had to actually fill in when you start with the business why is actually what is the user why? And there's a lot of nuance to it. Um, and it's also not 100% intuitive right away what the user why is. You need to talk to your users. So specifically, translating the business why of growing your supply of homes into a user why that looks much more like grow unique, high quality homes in specifically desirable locations and at reasonable price points. And that is actually really important because it pinpoints the, the values that users actually care about. So they care about the fact that the homes are unique. They're designed in a very special way. Um, people love tree houses and, and like um, homes that have that special um, like designer appeal. They need to be high quality. They need to be clean. They need to have great hosts. They need to be in very specific locations, ski in, ski out, and they need to be at reasonable price points. And so all of those factors are actually really important in actually getting um, someone to book on Airbnb, right? And so understanding that level of detail and framing it as a user why is super, super important. Um, a tip that I have for lots of folks is how do you make sure that you're ending your sentence with value for the user? Because typically when you're talking about a project or an initiative, um, it's very easy for other stakeholders um, or even the CEO or whoever else you're working with to talk about it from the perspective of uh, the business. So for example, um, when we actually, uh, so we launched an initiative called Airbnb Plus, Airbnb also purchased um, luxury retreats. And so it was very common to hear this refrain at the company. Wouldn't it be amazing if this product could help Airbnb complete, compete with luxury hotels? The better reframing, and when we really started to dig into this in terms of like, what can Airbnb actually provide that's differentiated, that um, is, is going to be able to compete in the long run from a business perspective, the user why was much better framed in the following way. Wouldn't it be amazing if users had a variety of high quality options that made their vacation time more special? And I think it became it became much broader, right? So you can imagine the type of product you could build with this user framing that is very different than the, the company framing. In the company framing, um, you, you can find yourself in a world where you're literally comparing point by point with a luxury hotel and being like, 
they have uh, these types of amenities. They have blackout shades. They have these types of um, soaps and containers and room service. It's actually very, very difficult for Airbnb to compete on those dimensions because from a cost perspective, that's very hard, but also we don't control our supply. It's a platform where any host essentially can offer their listing. So it's very, very important to understand that nuance and then frame it with the user why in order to understand the, the way that we can actually provide a valuable product for our users. So that's the first principle. Um, I'll move on to the second one, which is very closely coupled, which is it's incredibly important to separate the problem space from the solution space. So I'll walk through what each of these things mean and how it's very much related to the first principle of starting with your user. So this is what I would say probably the most um, typical reason or the, the most frequent reason for why products fail. And I hear this a lot with teams that I, I've worked with in the past, which is um, what if we built X? This, this thing that we're gonna build is going to be amazing. It's gonna solve all these problems. Like it's gonna be the next billion dollar company or billion dollar product. I think the problem is like that thinking is, is backwards and it doesn't work. And the reason for that is because you've assumed all, you've made all these assumptions in order to believe that your end solution is um, the right one. And you actually haven't figured out what people really truly want um, so that you can decide what solution or different solutions for each of the problems that they've identified is like the best one to work with. So this is why it's so important to separate the problem space and the solution space, because you first need to make sure you have an understanding of what the problem space is before you can even move to the solution space. So that's the key takeaway here. How do you make sure you're not starting with a solution space, which is typically what people do, and instead you're starting with a problem space, i.e., your user problem, your user need, and then after you fully identify that, moving to the right the right side of the picture here. So let's talk a little bit more about what what each what problem space actually looks like and how do you go about exploring that space um, effectively. So, like I mentioned, the problem space is all about deeply understanding your customer's problem, and the problem here is essentially some kind of unmet need or desire or want. One thing that is pretty important to remember is this could be a real problem or it could be a perceived problem. And being able to differentiate real versus perceived problems is very important. And just because something is a perceived problem does not mean it's not that worth um, essentially solving for. Like, are there ways to solve for something that's a perceived problem in a very lightweight way, in a very delightful way that actually dispels that perception and gets people to feel much more comfortable? And then the last thing I want to call out on the problem space, and this is very, very important, especially if you're building a product at a company where you're building a, a product where you're hoping to essentially, you know, have revenue and, and have it be sustainable on a, on a, like a business perspective is you have to make sure that your problem space when the problem that you've identified through this exercise is also an opportunity. And what I mean by an opportunity is that you actually believe that people will pay for the value that you're offering them. And so I'll give you, you know, one funny example of there are, time, there are many times where um, throughout history is like we've seen lots of examples where you find a problem and it's not always an opportunity. And a lot of the times it's because the economics of it don't work out. And so uh, this might be familiar to many of you and you also might not have heard of it, but there's a company called MoviePass. And MoviePass is a great example in my mind of a company that has found a great problem, a great desire, right, for people to be able to essentially go to the movies more often, pay less. Um, they have a great solution. It's very lovable. People <laughs> love that they can essentially pay X amount per month and go to unlimited movies. It's not, a, it's not an opportunity, though, because when you actually think about the way that users are going to interact with your pass, the way that um, the economics and unit economics of all this plays out, it doesn't work. And so, um, you know, you can do a lot of work in understanding the problem. But before you truly pass it over to, hey, let's get building, let's get looking, let's get looking at the solution, you need to make sure you're actually, um, you've actually found an opportunity. And that is very important for product managers at companies or CEOs or, or many different roles um, at these different, different, different companies. All right, so let's talk about the solution space. At which point can you move from the problem space to the solution space? This is when you feel like you have a very good sense of what the problem is and you believe that there's an opportunity 
you can finally start to ask yourself, well, how? How should we solve the problem that we've identified? So solution space is all about the how and a part of the what versus the problem space is very much about the why. Um, this is something that many of you guys might have heard of before, which is, you know, in the solution space, you know, it's really kind of a design problem, right? Like, and not just design in the sense of you're, you're doing UI, UX, design in the sense of what are we going to build and design in order to serve our customer. And so within design, there's a common framework that's talked about, um, the divergence and convergence framework or the double diamond, where essentially you first diverge and you think about all the different solutions that you could provide. Um, and then you converge and actually say, out of all of these di disparate ideas, these are the ones I think are most viable. And the way you do divergence and convergence effectively is actually being able to identify your constraints. So being able to say, cool, I've diverged, I have all these ideas, but I need to be very clear on here are my feasibility constraints, here are my viability constraints, and here are my desirability constraints. Taking those constraints, applying them to your ideas, being able to weed buckets of ideas out and converging on a final solution. All right, so the third principle, so we've talked about start with your user. We've talked about really separating out your problem space from your solution space, so jump, don't jump too quickly to solutions. I wanna talk about a principle of how do you listen to your users throughout this entire process. And so this principle um, is what I call, what, what I describe as you should be listening to your users, but you really should be taking their word as gospel. And this is super, super important. Your job as a product manager is essentially to be able to listen, gather information, synthesize a bunch of this information, and then decide what the right path is, as opposed to just taking people's word for what, what it is. Uh, so this is, this is a very famous quote. I'd be surprised if many of you haven't seen this before, um, but this kind of captures the spirit of this. So, you know, Henry Ford, and it's actually not even clear if he really said this, um, but it, it resonates really well for many people. So, you know, if, if Henry Ford back in the day had asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses, right? So it's really, what this really means is it's hard to ask your users what they want. What they think they want is not necessarily the best solution to their problem. And as y'all know, Henry Ford created the automobile, so the right solution was not faster horses, but actually the car. Um, so I wanted to actually walk through an example with you to really put this into perspective, um, to, to show you how it, like why it's so important to listen, but not to, um, again, take what is said as exactly what you need to do. So let's imagine that you're essentially going out and you're talking to customers and you hear the following. You hear one, we need more bike lanes on flat parts of San Francisco. Um, that's where I'm based. Uh, you also hear, I need a better helmet because they're so expensive. And then finally, you hear lots of people being like, oh, fix the roads. Road quality is super terrible. So each of these are your customers telling you, this is the solution I want. Bike lanes, better helmet, fix the roads. If you, if you listen to that and you're like, oh my goodness, great, thank you so much. Now I'm gonna move over to my product roadmap and I'm gonna put on bike lanes, better helmet and fix roads. That's where you can actually find yourself in a lot of trouble. Um, partly because you don't know if you're actually solving the root cause of what's what someone is complaining about, what's giving them pain. And also because some of these things are very expensive. So imagine if you put, you heard fix the roads and you put on your roadmap. Infrastructure improvements, not cheap. <laughs> and so I think it's again, really, really important to be able to identify what is actually causing these problems. So uh, let's walk through that. So in the case of, we need more bike lanes on flat parts of San Francisco. If you dig deeper, you actually might find that the real problem for a set, subset of users is that they want these bike lanes on these like like flat parts because they don't wanna go up and down hills because when they go up and down hills, they're really tired and they're really sweaty. And so the root cause of their problem, you can dig into this and realize is it's actually because they are sweaty when they get into work. That's a, again, think about installing showers at a specific workplace versus like getting the city to essentially commit to different types of bike lanes. Like one is much more feasible versus the other. Um, the second one, I need a better helmet because they're so expensive. There's a world where you give someone a better helmet and they do not bike more often, right? And because the root cause of what they're actually afraid of is I'm really afraid of getting hit by a car. Like that's why I want the helmet because somehow I've associated with the fact that a better helmet means I'm not gonna get hit. And then finally fix the roads, road quality is terrible. Maybe the root cause of that is that they're afraid of falling. So if you understand the problem and the root cause of the problem, that helps you then identify a much more effective, much more lovable um, solution. So 
in these cases, um, the first one, showers at work. And the second one, yes, these are expensive, protected bike lanes, but maybe there's nothing else for this group of users that would actually make them feel safe. And then the last one, uh, fix the roads because you're afraid of falling, a bike with better suspension, much cheaper than actually doing the infrastructure fix of the roads. So you can see how it's so important to actually identify um, what someone deeply cares about versus just hearing what they're saying at the beginning to be able to figure out the right solution for them. Because if you don't do that as a first step, you're not gonna be able to find something that is a lovable product for that person, period. Um, I want to spend just a few minutes on interview tips. I think this is important. I just, you know, shared with you guys, hey, it's really important not to take whatever your users are saying as gospel. How do you start to um, operationalize that? Uh, so a couple tips for you guys. The first one is one, this is very important. Don't get too fixated on your hypothesis, right? If you go in being like helmets must get better helmets for everyone, it's very easy to um only laser in on things that validate your hypothesis as opposed to just prove it. Um, and related to that is a second point, which is don't ignore inconvenient details. There's so many times where um, PMs on my team um, share a research report and they say, I did hear some of these things, but it didn't feel that important. Or, um, you know, I heard ABC, but really I think A was, was kind of like the main point. When something within B or C could actually be really illuminating in terms of why, like the, in terms of why their current understanding of the problem isn't the full picture. So if someone says, yes, yes, I really like that, but there are other things, you know, that I'm worried about that, but is super, super important to pay attention to. Another big tip, um, ask open-ended questions, right? So if you're leading the witness, it's very easy to get fixated on your hypothesis and to um, uh, essentially, again, validate what you already think is right. But if you have asked very open and questions, um, it gives you a lot more room essentially to get that information. And the last one is, um, this is just like a, an interesting tip that I found has worked really well, which is just wait for it. Sometimes silence is great. Just pause and it's gonna be uncomfortable because I think we all like to fill silences. And if and in those silences, you actually might find the, the best nuggets where someone just kind of mulls over something and is like, you know, I never thought about this way, but this really drives me nuts. Or, you know, I, I forgot to say this thing, but it's really kind of like sitting in the back of my head or bugging me. Those are, are really important gems that can actually help you understand the problem much, much better. All right. So the last piece, um, which is, it's interesting. I know that this talk was titled like, building the minimal level product. And I spent my first three points on making sure you really understand your user. And I think I just want to stress like that to me is the foundation in which everything is built upon. And so this fourth point is just some tips on how do you actually build lovability into your product. So I hope this section is um, very actionable and useful to you guys. But I do want to stress that there is a reason that the first three points are all about your problem and about your user. So if you do not get those right, number four just does not matter. Um, but yeah, so let's go through some of these tips. So, um, so I have five tips that uh, I'll spend a little bit of time on and we'll talk through some examples. The first one is uh, making sure you're solving the highest value problem. That is just a double check for you guys um, because if you're not double checking that constantly throughout your iteration, throughout your building process, um, you actually will make suboptimal decisions. The second one is de-risk and how do you actually de-risk your biggest assumptions? Um, it's important to actually pinpoint your simplest solution so at the beginning, I mentioned everyone loves making an awesome product. Everyone loves, you know, the next two things, sweating the details, all of that. But you also have a timeline often for your products and you get to market. And you make sure that, um, you know, you, you can get revenue in. Right. So like how do you actually pinpoint the simplest solution? Um, and then finally, oops, sorry. Um, the, the, the final two are more about how do you actually sprinkle that lovability in. So I have a concept that I call pixie dust and the two components of pixie dust in my mind are really being able to identify those magic moments and then sweating the details. So I'll go through each one in a little bit of detail and, and share an example. So, I, you know, I talked a lot about the highest value problem, but I'll end with this on that topic, which is when you give someone your product and they 
they play around with it, they, their face lights up, their immediate question is, can I use this now or when can I use this? That is a huge, huge indication that you found something really valuable. It's a very different reaction than what then you give someone something and they're like, oh, I have feedback on this, this and this, but that it kind of ends, right? As opposed to them being like, yes, I gave you a lot of feedback. I don't even care the, about the fact that this was a usability study. Can I get this product in my hands now? So that to me is one of those like moments where you say, I've really found something that is, is good is gold and is, is really could could be the foundation of something that is quite lovable. So that's a that's a, a tip around the high salary problem. Um, I want to talk a little bit how how did you risk your big assumptions? Because you know, a lot of times you can be like, yes, I found the problem. Now I want to build a little product. What's the what's the path from point A to point B? Um, and uh, what I advise people on here is make it really clear what your assumptions are about your user in your understanding of the problem space um, and your assumptions about your solution, right? We talked a little bit about like, what's a problem space, what's a solution space, how do you think about both of those uh, spaces? De-risking your assumptions is, is a really important tactic um, and practice. And so I'm not sure if that many people on this call know what this is. It's the old Palm Pilot, it's very old. And um, what they actually did is back in the day when they're trying to de de develop this, what they correctly pinpointed was one of the biggest risks was whether or not the size of this thing and the shape and the feel of all of it was something that would be portable because it was one of the first like really real portable kind of computing devices. Um, and it'd be something that people want to use. And so uh, especially when you're developing hardware, you could spend a long, long time. I mean, you will spend a long, long time getting the spec right, manufacturing it, and getting to the point where you're like, here you go, like here's an MVP, an MVP, not even MLP, right? Minimal viable. Um, instead, they're like, wow, I, like imagine a world where we spend nine months, 18 months even, working on this very complicated product. And if somehow we did not get the dimensions correct, that would be such a disaster. So how did they de-risk that? What they did is they essentially um, cut a block of wood and they asked people to essentially put it in their pockets or wherever they're gonna carry this, this future device. And through that, um, through carrying a block of wood for weeks at a time, they started to really refine, okay, this is the size, um, this is where like I can, you can carry in your, in your um, uh, shirt pocket, like if it's this big, you can carry it in your pant pocket, if it's this big, you know, what's the preference, men, women, etc. Um, there are no pockets, no shirt pockets for women, like how do they use it? So they learn a lot through that entire process. And they also did another cheap prototype. Once they figured out the size, they then basically printed what um, you could write on the Palm Pilot. And they gave everyone a little, little like pen, a little stick, uh, an actual pen. And so they would write on this printout and, and figure out like, okay, how big should the stylus be? What is the right ratio? At what point can you really not read what's on the pond plan anymore? So they found all these really, really smart, cheap ways to de-risk the solution and, and figure out how do you build something that people will love versus like will tolerate. So that's really important. All right, I'll talk a little bit about pinpointing the simplest solution. Um, so I'll take another Airbnb example. Um, Going back to this idea of like really delivering amazing high quality homes, uh, we had a concept called Airbnb Plus. It was a new line where we really wanted to provide homes that were inspected for quality and for comfort. And there are all of these ideas on what we could do to make that true. We can make sure every bed had four pillows on it. We can make sure that every home was expected after inspected after every single stay. Those are all incredibly expensive operationally. Well, we actually realized through um, a lot of understanding of the user, right, and the problem was at the end of the day, people just really wanted to know the layout of the space and wanted much more detail than typically what hosts would provide in terms of, um, of, of the description page. And so the simplest solution in getting people to feel that level of comfort, to feel that level of trust, was actually to deploy professional photography, do a step-by-step -step room tour, um, and, and really get people to understand the space that they're about to rent. And that is much cheaper than all the other options I mentioned before that were heavily um, operational, right? And so we went for a world where you essentially could get a host uploading whatever they wanted um, and, and a, 
a platform experience, kind of like a booking experience where we essentially just showed you picture by picture to a world where we actually showed you all the entire space. We helped you categorize all the different rooms and we did a walk through of the home with you. So what would have been a solution that could have required inspection hundreds of times a year resulted in a solution where we essentially did a pro photography session and, and like an inspection every six months. So it's just a very different solution um, that is much cheaper, but still delivers that lovability that people are really craving. All right, so the next thing which is related, uh, the next two things are very related and I talked about pixie dust is how do you identify your magic moment? Um, and this is where I think you really need to think about technology and all of the new things that technology enables you to do. So for example, um, the magic moment for a lot of our guests when I came to check in was uh, because we had GPS information, we could actually notify them when they were close to their location. This is These are your check-in instructions. And then once you got in, we could actually notify you and help you connect to the, the Wi-Fi. And so that is a true magic moment that a platform could do very cheaply um, that doesn't involve a lot of effort, but really increases lovability. And then finally, like sweating the details is so important as a, as a product manager. Um, you're... It, it, it's not going to always feel intuitive because, again, you're going to feel like I have a deadline. I have to ship this thing. How do I do that in a way where it's still polished um, and find that balance is important? Um, so I just want to give a, a Webflow example. Um, so when we launched new breakpoints, um, we really sweat the details both in the actual product. But you can actually do it cheaply if you don't if you sweat details around the product as well. And what we specifically did is we made sure that there was educational content. Um, so this is Webflow University. Uh, we made sure there was educational content, there was blog stuff, there was everything out there in order for people to feel really equipped to essentially learn about our new feature. And then uh, going back to just the simplest solution, uh, this is really to another concept, but I just want to show how it all ties together. Um, you know, we could we could do a million breakpoints, infinite breakpoints, but if you actually you know know exactly what are the, the devices people are building for, right? That becomes a very finite number of breakpoints and solutions. And so going back to simplify um, and pinpoint the simple solution, how do you do that? Plus sweat the details around um, making a delightful experience and all the details around onboarding and education, those things come together to create a really amazing uh, product that people love. So I think that actually gets me to 30 minutes. So I just wanna quickly recap. Um, you know, building minimal level product at the end of the day really comes down to first building minimal viable product and then building lovability in. So building minimal viable product means you fundamentally understand your business, uh, sorry, your user problem, right? So as I said, the first three things, start with the user's why, separate the problem space out before you just jump into the solution space and really, really deeply listen to your users and understand the root of what they're experiencing as opposed to just what they're expressing to you. Those are all principles that help you understand the viability and give you inputs into how you make this lovable. And finally, I went through a couple of tips with regards to how do you actually actionably um, build lovability into your product? And those were the five tips I just talked about. So with that, I'm hoping that all of you guys are gonna be serving non-burnt pizza in your respective roles. Um, and that's really it. Um, you know, thank you for your time. You can reach me on Twitter, LinkedIn, or, or on my website. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions that people have. Awesome. Thanks, Jay-Z. I'm now very hungry for pizza. <laughs> so we had, some, we had some really great questions come up, and I'm going to go through them. So the first question is from Sally. As Sally asks, how do you apply these principles on incremental improvements to your existing product versus building a brand new solution? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. I think that whenever you're building um, anything, I do think a lot of these principles apply. So for example, even if you're optimizing, um, call it like a funnel, uh, understanding kind of like what drives someone um, to, like what's the pain in that funnel to date will help you pick the points in your funnel in which you should focus on. And a lot of times, you know, People do categorize, call it like growth experiments, funnel experiments, more optimizations and incremental improvements um, versus let's say you're building a zero to one product. But I would say a, a lot of these principles do apply. So even I'll give you a very specific example. Um, you know, if you're building an, like an incremental improvement, um, 
there are ways to essentially just do it really quickly versus there are ways where you're like, I'm going to actually take a moment and make sure that um, this form that I've added, right, is is actually the most streamlined way for someone to interact with, with this product. And so there is a piece of that sweating the details. There's a piece of um, like truly like trying to deliver a magic moment um, that is that is important. Awesome. Yeah, I know this. The um, this isn't this example isn't about incremental, but really about sweating the details. I can talk about uh, my experience of when I worked at Apple. Um, we had um, when I was working at Apple, we had the executive speaker series where we could ask the executive any any questions that we had about their product management process, how they build products. And um, one of the questions that somebody asked in the audience was, you know, when the first iPhone came out, why did the first iPhone not have copy and paste? And when you think about it, it's such a, like an obvious feature. Of course, you should have copy and paste, right? Every phone should have that. Um, and Johnny Ive, you know, when he was sitting on stage, you know, how he is in his videos, he's British, he thinks a lot, it's how he is in person. And he's like, well, you know, it's not like we forgot to put it in copy and paste. We couldn't figure out how to do it well. You know, they couldn't, they hadn't sweat the details of how to do it well in this new form. So they didn't put it in, in at all. And really, I think that's really another way of um, adding to what you've said about really sweating the details and making sure that the product that's in the market isn't just viable, it's lovable. And then, uh, and I, so, that's becoming more and more important with the enormous amount of competition that, that exists. Totally. Yeah. So another question is from Rhythm. And Rhythm asked, um, would you be able to talk about some tactical tools or frameworks that you've used that, you know, companies like Airbnb, we work to help you with on the discovery side. Like, you know, do you have a preference for design sprints or using jobs to be done or, you know, like tactically, what are these frameworks that you've used to help you really nail in on the problem space? Yeah. Um, it, it really does depend on the company, the stage of the product. I think a lot of the things that were just mentioned are actually great tools. So. Uh, I'll just maybe talk a little bit about each of them. So for example, design sprints. The benefit of a design sprint is that you have dedicated time, time bound of time, um, and also a bunch of stakeholders all involved in order to figure out, hey, let's let's really um, understand the problem and, and figure out the solution. I think with design sprints, it's a little bit more, it's, it's more focused on the solution space. So I, I would say that's a great tool for once you've understood the problem that you would run a design sprint with these stakeholders, again, time bound to the week, right? You know, the Google Ventures design sprint. Um, and, and that's very effective, but it, it the design sprint, for example, is less about really understanding your user. I think um, when it comes to your user, it depends on the life cycle of your company. So if you're, if you're starting your own company, you have the uh, you have like infinite space to go figure out what user you want to focus on. And I think um, there's a concept, uh, I didn't talk about it today, but that I do have, which is like, you, know, you have to choose your adventure, you have to choose your game. And what I mean by that is um, you have to decide, especially like if you're a founder or like the first PM or whatever it is, I would actually say really the founder, right? Like what, who are you solving for? What problem do you care about? Um, as a founder, you're probably going to work on this thing for a very long time. And so you choosing the game you want to play is very important. And when you choose your game, in, in essence, you define the boundaries of like your user. And when you define the boundaries of your user, you essentially then get to get to the point where you're looking at the problem. Um, something that's really important is like, how do you define the boundaries of your user? And I think a, a lot of times uh, people make the mistake of being like, a, B, C, D, E, F, G, they're all my user. And you're like, you actually, you probably can't solve for, you know, population A through G's problems at the same time. Who do you actually care about? Who do you, um, you know, going back to your game, who do you want to choose to, to solve that, that like problem for? And so a tip I have there is your users should be more similar than they are different, right? To be able to actually give them something um, and understand what they might need. So that's that's one important thing. So choose your user very carefully and be very crisp of like, this is in versus out in terms of my user group. Then I think um, just going back to all the stuff I just talked about with regards to understand the problem space, all those apply in real terms that could involve doing a longitudinal study around just like the user journey for a given person, right? So how do I, 
um, you know, for a person who has a life that looks like this or a day-to-day -day job that looks like this, and, and I think you just mentioned jobs to be done, right? Like if, if this is my role or these are the problems I'm trying to um, surmount day-to-day, -day, what does my user journey look like? And throughout that user journey, are there areas where um, there's a lot of inefficiency? So that's a great tool for you to essentially understand, um, are there points that you could essentially address that are like deep pain for, for your user? So those are, I mean, I talked very broadly and I'm happy to go into a, a specific framework, but um, I think high level takeaway is choose who you care about, use use ways to understand their day-to-day, -day. like you know, it's many frameworks are out there, but just figure out how to understand their day-to-day. -day. You could shadow them, you know, all these different things. And then once you zoom into their problem, that's when you can start to use other frameworks to really explore your solution space. Awesome. I. I love your first piece of advice, which is pick your users, right? Like, no, we all, as founders, we want to be everything to everyone. We want to have a large company, but at the end of the day, no successful product ever was launched for everyone. Like launching vanilla is the hardest thing to do in the world. Yeah. Um, Airbnb started um, in the founders like New York apartment. Facebook started on Harvard's campus, right? Really pick understanding your first set of users. Um, that's that's really cool. Uh, shout out to Andrew. He's asking all these really great questions, I think. Um, so I'm going to pick one of Andrew's questions because he's asking a lot. One of his questions are, um, how do you manage the process of evaluating the highest value problem? Highest to whom? Alignment to strategy, uh, measuring value. How do you how do you pick the highest? Hmm, interesting. So there's two parts to that, and it's embedded in the wording, right? So there's like highest and then there's value <laughs> um, in the sense that like, at the end of the day, I think there's two pieces. There's first, you have to understand what's the highest value to the user. So this is related to first the first principle. Then I'm assuming that your, your role is the PM, not like the GM or the CEO, right? So if you understand the highest value to the user, and what that really means is, it is their most painful problem. It is most likely the one that they are most willing to pay for a solution for. Um, and, and pay could be in the form of money. It could also be, oh my gosh, I spend this amount of time, right? Like, and, and it like shrinks my time in a certain way. Because again, you know, the payer for any given solution could be very different at like B2B companies, et cetera. So I would start with what is the highest value problem um, that is most painful that there's some degree of like value, payment, time, something, a unit associated with that for the user. Then it is part of your job to then map it to your, your company and your or your organization, whatever degree that you're working at. So, okay, cool. I'm working in the newsfeed org at Facebook. I've identified a bunch of problems, but my, like if a bunch of them have nothing to do with the way people browse the newsfeed, that's not going to be something I focus on. It's going to be something maybe another org focuses on, or you know, at a at a broader scale, if it's just not something that your company's tackling, you shouldn't be. You should essentially not be pursuing that particular problem set, right? And so, as a PM, you're going to get input from the business on on in terms of like strategically, what do we want? To, where do we want to be, revenue wise, all, all that information, and you need to parse that input along with the input that you have around um, the user problem. Awesome. That's great. Um, one, I was talking to a VC and one of the way I asked him, like, how do you quantify pain? Uh, what's your formula for it? And they said that they quantify pain by looking at the frequency times magnitude of how often something happens. So when you think about like Uber, you know, how often do you need transportation? A lot. And how, you know, how much pain is it to order a taxi? Really, really painful. And so the best problems are those problems that have huge pain and happen the most. Uh, yeah. So another question is from Mandy and Mandy said, um, I'm a junior product manager and uh, the part I struggle with most is asking users the right questions to get to the root cause of the problem. Uh, initially in the, especially in the initial interviews, do you have any tips to help prepare for the initial interview with users? Yeah. Um, so I think it, it kind of goes to some of the things I was talking about with regards to how do you ask the right open-ended questions? How do you not lead with some of the hypotheses that you might have before you even get to an interview? Um, so I really think about asking users questions in two buckets. The first bucket is more just like understanding, 
the problem. And the second bucket is understanding if the solution you're providing will solve that problem. So when you're trying to just understand the problem holistically, um, yes, it is an art. And I don't know I could go if I could go into like all the different ways you would like ask those questions. And, and they're very different for whatever product you're working on. So here's here's the tip I, I think is probably most uh, it resonates the most with me at a high level, which is, you know, if, if, if you can just shadow someone, right, like spend time in their workplace, spend time in whatever kind of like situation you're trying to solve that problem for them. That is my highest, like highest level tip, because, you know, we can go into, you know, interview like best practices, but I think um, it, it's hard to really parse out exactly. And, and like, there's a role out there that's not the PM role that does this and it's a user research role. So um, I, I always say this to my team, I expect a PM to be able to do user research. I do not expect them to be the best user researcher, right? And so what I would just recommend for PMs out there is like, well, one, think about the resourcing of your company. Can you actually get help? Two, if you can't, how do you just put yourself in a situation where you're really observing people and what they're doing? And that will give you at least some kind of next step of like, these are the areas I want to dig into. And then when you have the areas you want to dig into, then I think some of the tips that I mentioned before you know, open-ended questions around, hey, like, tell me more about this. How do you feel about this? Like, those types of questions will give you the um, open space or will give your users the open space essentially to respond to you. Another big thing that you should do is you should always make sure that people are comfortable and that you're not associated with anything. And, and that's more relevant to the second bucket I mentioned. So after you understand the problem, you're going to very likely be going back to your users and being like, hey, I have options A and B. Which one do you like? And it is very, very easy for people to get very uncomfortable because they're like, oh my gosh, the person asking me these questions, like they're the PM of this thing. Like I have to say something, like if I, if I don't like A or B, I can't be like, this sucks. And so what I, a tip I ask my PM to do is, um, you know, if, if people don't know that you're the PM, you can actually go in and be like, I don't have anything to do with this project. Like I'm just doing some research on this. I, You can say whatever, I'm not gonna get offended. Help me understand and like, you know, what about this is working for you? What about it isn't working for you? And by the way, you can be like, none of it's working for me. And so that is more around my tips on the second bucket where you're more in your solution space and trying to understand, you know, the pain at a more granular level and whether or not your solutions uh, fix that pain. Awesome. That's great. Well, yeah, it's uh, really important to let the people you're interviewing be comfortable so they can really open up and you avoid confirmation bias, which is the number one reason why interviews fail. So yep. that, yeah, that's awesome. So with that, guys, I want to, Jay-Z, want to thank you for coming in today. And there's a lot of questions. We weren't able to get to all of them, but I really want to thank you for coming in um, and, and giving us all this wisdom. Uh, we will share the slides. Don't worry. We'll share the slides with you, everyone uh, that came to the event. And uh, with that, thank you everyone for coming. Uh, if you enjoyed the event, which we hope you did, uh, please tag product faculty on LinkedIn and Twitter. And, uh, you know, we'd love to hear your feedback on it. And and with that, so now we're going to go into the networking portion of uh, this event, which is really fun. Essentially, what you do is you hit that little networking handshake. And when you hit the networking handshake and you say that you're ready to go, you can hit you're ready. You'll be paired up with someone who you can network for three minutes. And so it's uh, so. Uh, done at random. It's really fun. You get to meet people. Um, Jay-Z will be doing a few of these as well. So you might be paired up with her. So that's your incentive for networking. And um, and yeah, so we'll do that. And if you guys agree, you can both click connect and you can connect with each other and exchange contacts and, and form, uh, form friendships even outside of this. So let's head on over to networking and I'm looking forward to, to meeting everyone. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. And see you guys over at networking. Thank you, guys. See you soon.